I'd like to call upon the panelists for the supply chain panel. I see all of you are on board. So may I request Eileen Bakuram, Chris Bogart, Kevin Cast, and Matthew Yedwabnik. Would you kindly join us? Well, there you are. Thank you. To get the ball rolling, may I request each one of you, and if you could go in the alphabetic order, that would be great, starting with Eileen. Please introduce yourself and share with us what is currently got you so engaged at the company you work for. So Eileen, would you kindly start? Sure, uh, my name is Eileen Bakiran, a head of global supply chain and business operations for Orchard Therapeutics. Uh, Orchard is based in London, our headquarters are in London, and we're in the hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy space. Uh, in December 2020, we received an EMA approval, so full market authorization for Libmeldi in Europe. And uh, Libmeldi is ex vivo autologous gene therapy for the treatment of metachromatic leukodystrophy, so MLD. Uh, we also have several programs, genetic programs in our pipeline, all autologous gene therapy. Uh, in my role in supply chain, I am responsible for three things, uh, planning, site qualification, and global distribution for clinical and commercial supply. So essentially all of the customer facing uh, front of the supply chain. And I think what has me engaged, I mean, you know, I've been in the industry a few years now. Um, oh, I should say I'm based in the, in the SF Bay area, even though my, my company is in London. So 4 a.m. is not unusual for me. <laughs> Devendra, you could have called me, I would have been up. Um, but uh, what has me engaged really with our company, I think our discipline in supply chain has never really been front and center until, I mean, we've, we've always played an important role in operations, right? And, and keeping the engines running, but really we're front and center in the cell and gene therapy space. And it has been uh, at least the last uh, two years that I have been with Orchard been a really good challenge for, for me and personal development, professional development, but also in, in, in advancing uh, gene therapy for all of us. Thank you, Aline. Chris Bogart and Bear. Yeah, thanks, uh, Devendra, and uh, thanks for inviting me here. It's uh, great to be here. Um, yeah, so Chris Bogart here with, with Bear Pharmaceuticals. I'm the uh, Vice President of uh, Supply Chain and Materials Management for the our Berkeley, California site, which is our um, biotech manufacturing hub and one of the key sites in our, our biotech um, network in the company. Um, and what's, uh, what's getting me engaged is that uh, we're, we're actually building out a lot of cell and gene therapy capability at the Berkeley site right now. <clears throat> I mean, literally pouring the foundation for a cell therapy uh, module um, as I speak here. And, and it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. It's very exciting to be um, at the beginning of that, uh, to build that for the, for the network. Um, we have to build a lot of clinical and launch capability both um, you know, technical wise, but from a supply chain perspective, we have to build the business processes around that uh, for, the, for the site to support our, our growing pipeline, which the company has been investing heavily, um, mostly through you know, external in innovation. So, so we're engaged to basically you know, enable the, um, the fulfillment of that, that pipeline, you know, hopefully in the, in the near term. No, you, you must really be a busy executive, Chris, because I keep reading about all the strategic acquisitions and relationships that Baird is establishing worldwide. And so much probably depends on what you're doing at the Berkeley site. And I will address that issue with you later on uh, during the panel discussion. Uh, Kevin Cast, Artmo Consulting. Thank you, Devondra. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm Kevin Cast, I'm a consulting. We are now a member of the Omnicom Health Group, so we roll up under the market access team of Andre Health and Valuate. Um, here at Archbow, we spend about half of our time in patient support services, helping manufacturers, cell gene therapy companies build a patient support service uh, portfolio or plat platform. And about the other half of our time, in what I'd call more downstream supply chain, almost to what Devondra coined a couple of years ago, more of a demand chain type of a solution. We spent about half our time in that regard. Um, the thing that 
keeps sort of uh, me engaged, especially in cell gene therapy, really are threefold. Number one is streamlining, or maybe I would say conforming the downstream supply chain to the institutions and the mechanisms for patient delivery of product. I think that's one thing that is of extreme importance. How do we actually get the product into the patient with all the various models out there? Another one is the difference of patient support services from a normal orphan product to cell gene therapy. Many, many other services should be offered to these patients and families in need. And then probably the third thing is pair mechanisms. All the pairs out there, as I think we all know, payers aren't set up for a one and done million dollar plus curative therapy. And they're all now developing unique mechanisms to pay for these products. So I think we'll talk about that more later, but those are the three things that primarily have, uh, have me engaged in cell gene therapy. I think the issues of engagement you brought up, Kevin, are the ones we definitely want to explore further uh, during this discussion. Uh, may I call upon Matthew Yadrabnik of uh, Atara? Matt? Hello, everybody. Thank you. Uh, and Devendra, thank you for getting my last name correctly. I'm Matt Yudwabnik, uh, VP of Supply Chain from Atara Biotherapeutics. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, Atara is focused on allogeneic uh, T cell therapies. I've had the pleasure over the last four years uh, of, of leading our, our clinical supply uh, from you know, phase two into pivotal and readiness for commercial manufacturing and supply on our lead program. And then Looking in our pipeline, uh, what keeps me engaged? Uh, our second program is a very exciting opportunity for multiple sclerosis, which represents a much larger population than our, our lead program in lymphoma. And, and the, the, the necessities for our company is really to bring our process to a, to a large scale manufacturing uh, of allogeneic T cells and, 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 and also a, you know, a adequate supply chain to be able to handle the downstream end of it. So that definitely keeps me engaged. Very happy to be with you all today. I see some great names on the call and looking forward to the conversation. As uh, all of us uh, can tell, the diversity of this panel uh, really gives you considerable confidence that the supply chain challenges are being met and not that they're easy, they're incredibly difficult. And therefore I'd like to begin with something that I have no clue about. And so question for Eileen and probably for uh, Kevin as well, and maybe Matt, how does that patient care facility look like? Whether it be at a medical center or at a hospital or at your place of work? What, what are the dimensions of that, that operation? Eileen, would you help me understand what that is? Yeah, um, so maybe what I can do is speak towards how do we get qualified treatment centers, right? And treatment centers that, that, are, that, are, that can deliver our care. And, um, and then I can turn it all over to my colleagues for maybe some of uh, the other facets of your question. But qualified treatment centers for us um, are, are centers of excellence that have uh, experience in the neurometabolic disease space. And we selected them all over Europe, where again, we, are, we have approval and, and established in this last year and a half, a site qualification process. And the four main pillars for us, we tried to make it as simple as possible. The four main pillars of the site qualification process for us were an introduction phase where we have a kickoff meeting and site assessment, an audit phase where we do a GMP audit, uh, shipment, which is the mock shipment training and the mock shipment itself, and the knowledge and experience sharing, which is the training uh, on the product manual and any, uh, any shipping and logistics training. Um, and then, so that's, that's what, a quali what, that, what it takes to be a qualified treatment center for Libmeldi. There are challenges there. As you know, we've all heard it. The, the hospital sites are very, very busy. A majority of our sites are in Europe. We work with um, some sites in the U.S. as well. But, but really, the message is the same across all the sites. We're busy. There's a lot of you, and there's only one of us, <laughs> one hospital. So I think um, what had made us successful over this last 
year or year and a half has really been three things. One is a clearly laid out process, timelines and expectations. Number two, make it easy for them, right? So move to Zoom and remote wherever possible, including our audits. And then three, I see them on the line. I see Greg on the line, um, partnering with a vendor who has cell and gene therapy experience. So Be The Match Biotherapies is our partner and they've helped us through the site qualification process and now with patient logistics. And it's been great because the sites know who they are uh, because of all the work that many of you probably do with them. And, and I, I feel that we've been able to address the site's concerns. Thank you, Eileen. Uh, I feel a lot more knowledgeable now. And of course, I have a lot of questions. But Kevin, what does that medical hospital look like that you have dealt with? So, so I think the answer is they look different today than they did when CAR-Ts were first launched. I think when CAR-Ts were first launched, well, those institutions had some good experience in the clinical trial world. The commercial world, of course, is a whole different world, right? Uh, flash title models, et cetera, trying to get the products paid for. Uh, I don't want to say fighting with, but doing battle at times with the PBMs on who's going to pay for the product, et cetera. So we, we started doing research in the institutional marketplace in the global, in the sort of the global sense as, as well, trying to understand, you know, if you get a doer into a hospital, what happens to it? Uh, years ago, uh, like when Tim talked about when he, when he helped launch uh, some of the original car -Ts, most of the institutions probably didn't have a minus 180 freezer. So now you, is it, it's not possible to have doers stacking up in a narrow, older institution hallway, right? It's not possible to add a new printer for every CAR-T therapy or every cell gene therapy. And I, th I, think, I think you said it best, Eileen, uh, there's one of them and hundreds of us, right, trying to beat down their door and get a piece of them, and they just aren't set up for it. So I think it's a matter of you know, an evolution in this process, and the evolution has happened. And now that hospitals have SOPs, they have cell gene therapy teams, uh, they can get their arms around better better and better administration of said products. And then of course, I think maybe Matt can come on this too, on this too, because the future of cell gene therapy isn't always gonna be in hospital administration. It could be outpatient administration. It could be a community medical oncology where the biggest care is, you know, or most of the uh, cancer care is given today in the States. Different of course than, than Europe, et cetera. But I don't think they look today like how they used to look so clunky in the past because everyone's evolving and we're getting better at it. And I'll say one more thing, Tim made a very good point though. The more we could work together and help standardize the SOPs and the processes in and amongst the institutions, if that's even possible, the better that would be for the patients who are demanding and asking us to help solve this problem for them. I just want to respond spontaneously to the last remark you made. I think it's imperative, Kevin, that in this growing industry where so much learning has to take place, so much experimentation has to be conducted, that what, unless there's a competitive thing called the intellectual property itself, why should we not be collaborating? And I, I think this platform that we have right now, and there's so many other platforms like this, is a place where this hopefully will happen. And I, I feel it today. Uh, I've learned so much and I'm sure others have learned a lot. Uh, Matt or others, uh, anything to add to what uh, Ali and uh, Kevin have shared with us? Yeah, just one comment. I think Kevin mentioned it. I, I think a lot of the cell therapy experience is certainly in the oncology cancer facilities in and across the world, you know, these are top tier institutions with capabilities that they've built. But, you know, just like Atara's uh, second program, we expect to be expanding much beyond that area of expertise to, to smaller outpatient clinics that won't have the same capabilities. And, you know, that is to your point, Devendra, where, you know, standardization is, is important as well as on our side, from a development standpoint, everything we can do to simplify the, the life of the patient uh, side of care, you know, uh, you know, as simple as possible from a you know dosing standpoint, um, standardizing the ancillaries that may be used for dosing, uh, as Kevin talked about, um, standardizing where possible the solutions related to cold storage and cold chain, um, 
on, and, and I think as Tim mentioned, chain of custody, chain of integrity, all of the documentation, that, that is going to be critical uh, as, as more and more therapies and more and more indications uh, grow in this space. We, we have to find a way to work together to simplify this for the sites of care. Thank you, Matt. I have to ask you a question that has got me stumped. And I'll pick on Eileen, if I may. How does one conduct SNOP in a situation like this, where you're patient-driven, where you're, you're one of a kind? How do you plan your operations that's going to drive this, this huge investment of yours? So Eileen, how do you do SNOP for cell and gene therapy? I think as uh, compared to more traditional SNOPs, I think the emphasis on the demand planning arm of SNOP becomes really, really critical. Uh, and that's what we've really focused on as soon as, as soon, that's what we've been focusing on on our SNOP processes. So partnering with our field-based colleagues, we've instituted um, what we believe is a pretty strong demand planning process where we can gain insight on patient leads um, understand the lead time between patient ID all the way through reimbursement and through when they're actually scheduled and treated, and it'll allow us visibility to oncoming demand. Again, we're fairly new. We just received approval, so we're still continuously refining this process, and the more data that we collect, we can do, we can, the better the job we can do in demand planning. But yeah, I, I think in terms of establishing your SNOP process for a make-to-order product like um, what we have, it is the demand planning process just becomes maybe your key factor for success. Matt, any more uh, light you could shed on the, this thing called make to order? Um, absolutely. I think uh, it, you know it obviously depends on the therapy that you're that you're managing uh, and where you draw the line. And you know if you have the ability to to store inventory, put inventory on the shelf. Um, that's a critical decision in your planning process. Uh, in, in our space, uh, from an upstream manufacturing standpoint, it's allogeneic, it's make to inventory. Um, but from a downstream standpoint, we are effectively have a personalized uh, medicine where we are uh, you know, identifying based on the patient's HLA typing, the appropriate product to, to send to them, which is an individualized shipment. Um, and so that, that is personalized medicine uh, from, a, from a downstream supply chain. Uh, and it is a customized make to order uh, dose that has to make it to just that patient um, in, in, in a timely fashion. And so it, it, it does require, you know, coordinated distribution planning uh, with um, the sites, with your logistics team, uh, with your other vendors, uh, depots, if you're, if you're leveraging them. Uh, and it, and it, you know the standard SNOP process is is the way you you pursue that, and I think as Eileen talked about, understanding you know your demand side is is, is critically important as well as understanding your supply capabilities. Matt, while I got you, uh, I freeze or I shudder at the thought of packaging that product and shipping to God knows wherever. What does that look like? Um, for, for our products, uh, we're leveraging cryogenic liquid nitrogen uh, storage from the manufacturing all the way through to the patient, uh, which comes with challenges. Uh, I think as, as, as other panelists talked about, not every uh, facility of site of care may have uh, liquid nitrogen freezers. Uh, and uh, as additionally, not every you know, supply chain third party logistics vendor has capabilities. And so the, managing a, a, a complex cold chain is, is part of what we have to do. Um, the, there are advantages uh, as well, right? The, the, the liquid nitrogen actually enables really amazing shelf life. So for allogeneic cell therapies, that, be, that becomes a, a key value driver uh, of using liquid nitrogen um, from the standpoint of storage. And I think we saw some of this even the examples of the industry where uh, the COVID vaccines leverage a similar kind of approach with liquid nitrogen bulk storage and then um, uh, you know temperature studies that were used to qualify 
uh, lesser requirements like dry ice or uh, frozen or even refrigerated uh, time time periods that could be uh, that could enable the, the vaccines to travel much farther uh, throughout the world and 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 really treat the, the patient need. And so you, you really kind of saw that as an example of where thoughtful development uh, combined with the cold chain understanding uh, of the industry, you know, differentiated a product uh, and enabled uh, some some vaccines to be far more successful. We see that as a great example for cell therapy. Uh, we certainly, we, we like the advantages of liquid nitrogen and bulk level, but we wanna plan to adapt to the better temperature conditions down the, down the supply chain. Considering how knee deep you are already into that packaging with temperature control distribution, are there any guidelines you would give to those startup companies that there appear to be hundreds of them regarding how they should develop their product, keeping in mind at the early stage what those distribution challenges are, how could they be mitigated? Yeah, um, a couple of comments and maybe I'll open it up to the panel as well. But um, you know, the, if you are using cryogenic, uh, you realize that labeling becomes almost a permanent aspect you label the product and you send it into the freezer and it's not going to change. So designing your primary label uh, versus what information you can maintain on a secondary package or secondary carton is certainly something you should take advantage of where possible. Uh, designing as much flexibility at the, at the bulk primary uh, containers labels and, and, and packaging operation and postponing that uh, uh, as much as possible for the secondary package. And I, I think we've seen from our experience, the regulators are certainly uh, willing to work uh, and understand those challenges. Um, you know, the, so I think it's a, it's a, it's a, the industry is changing on that front uh, to, to, a, to help a company uh, enable that kind of flexibility if you have cryogenic. Um, the, the other piece I would say is, you know, the, the, the capabilities, uh, for, for your supply chain, I think do, do a proper analysis of what's available in the industry and make decisions about you know, investing yourself versus uh, finding a third party in terms of storage and distribution. Uh, it, it is uh, a, a significant portion of, uh, of the, the cost and complexity for cell therapies that, that can't be underestimated. And I think even as Tim described it, I had an entire slide on his strategy it really needs to be thought through from the beginning in terms of uh, the, the, the near-term supply chain and the long-term supply chain and how it's going to be best achieved with your strategy. Well, well said, uh, Matt. Thank you very much for that insight. Uh, anyone else on the panel that would like to add? Yeah, Devendra. Go, go ahead, Chris. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris. Go, yeah. go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I was just going to echo um, some of what uh, Matt described. Uh, around the supply chain setup and the different aspects to consider. With our um, gene therapy lead asset, we did some supply chain design, which I would recommend everyone to do to the extent that you can, you know, ahead of time, um, essentially, you know, simulating various different supply chains with thoughtful assumptions and, and interestingly have come to a very sim similar um, uh, make to stock and make to order setup because we can we can hold inventory, um, frozen inventory, but it's expensive. Um, but uh, yeah, came to a similar similar outcome there. Um, but also in, in looking at that with the other side note from a development standpoint, and, and this totally was not expected, is that um, you know, the analysis showed that uh, the SKU setup, um, the SKU setup for this therapy to make it personalized, basically based on body weight, a lot simpler than what Tim Tim showed us, um, but was off, right? And, and actually we, we were able to show that the total cost of the product uh, in, in, in the supply, with the whole supply chain model um, was higher with these additional SKUs that the development team had put in place. So that was actually an improvement for the overall, the overall process. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to echo very, yeah, very similar um, um, outcome. Although this is still, you know, in, in the design phase, it's, it's interesting to hear, uh, Matt, that you you came to basically the same same conclusions. A question for you, yeah, yeah, Kevin. You were saying something. 
Yeah, so, sorry, Devon. I was going to just uh, comment real quick. So I, I love Matt and, and Chris's comment about sort of evaluating what's available with the current supply chain vendors. I think Albert Cooksey is on one of the panels. Maybe he can comment a bit uh, more on the time with, about World Courier's massive investment in you know freezing and refrigerator space uh, globally. But I think that's an important thing is to take your time and really assess where things are today with the various vendors, partners, logistic partners, et cetera, out there on a global situation so you know what you might have to do on your own or choose to do on your own. And then when it comes to the whole comment about labeling and packaging and everything, I think th there's really two different issues there. One is, you know, for a clinical trial, of course, which is a little more simpler. But then the next is keep in mind that even the, the, the labeling, the primary and especially the secondary labeling have to conform to State Board of Pharmacy. And that's why you have all these companies like, uh, you know, Express Scripts and Accredo and CVS and Optum Frontier Therapeutics and Eversana, right? They've all developed these really interesting flash title models for the commercial delivery of products. And those should all be vetted out well in advance of, of product launch as well. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, the impression that I got uh, listening to an earlier conversation was that while you folks and the therapy companies are so focused on developing the unique therapy itself. The challenges of storage and handling, et cetera, et cetera, are best served by the experts, meaning the logistics companies, the transportation companies. As long as there's a dialogue between the two entities, the product developers, the therapy engineers talk about their product requirements, and then the suppliers of services look at how they can be delivered. Is that a bad conclusion or a sound conclusion? I think it's an extremely sound conclusion. Um, and you know, you, there's, there's, there's a, a wise man once said, it wasn't me, I can't even remember who said it, Devonder, but you know, never get in the way of a willing prescription. <laughs> right. So yeah, you have a physician uh, who's deemed a CAR T or cell gene therapy to be the best for the patient. The patient's agreed. Um, let's let the people who dispense products and take care of patients and run patient support programs uh, challenge them all to meet the manufacturer's expectations. And I know I know many of the, the folks on the panel have done so very successfully. So I think it's a matter of challenging them to make sure that they can do what needs to get done as conforming to you know, the laws, regulations, et cetera, uh, across the globe of you know, various requirements. So no, I, I think it's a super sound conclusion. And then considering how much of focus you folks have given assigned to uh, packaging and storage and cold chain uh, temperature control distribution, uh, we do have an authority and expert to address those issues in very granular detail later on in the program. And that, as you rightly said, Kevin, is Albert Cooksey from ICS Ameritsos Bergen. I want to proceed with or resurrect what Timothy Moore challenged us regarding information for tracking and tracing and chain of custody, chain of identity, chain of all that stuff. I want to start with Eileen at Orchard Therapeutics, a startup company. Where do you begin, Eileen? And then I want to ask others from a systems point of view of achieving this mandatory requirement of tracking traceability for accountability. Where do you begin? Yeah, so we are a startup. We are, our patient population is fairly small. Um, actually really small, uh, we're in the rare space. So our business processes are manual today, which I must say made me a little bit nervous, but if you build a business process that's manual um, and, and put the, belt, the belts around it and, and, and you're comfortable with it, I think it's much easier to automate uh, later on down the line. I think um, a manual business process is not unusual for a company our size. I believe the, you know, the initial car teeth uh, spaces, from what I understand, started off manual as well, um, that there were some, some of them that had started off manual as well. Um, 
and today we're in the process of evaluating our digital capabilities and how do we grow. And the main thing, where do we start, I think is, is your question. And, and for us, it's really the voice of the customer. Again, how do we make it easy for our, our hospitals that may have multiple, um, multiple tools at their disposal and which one do we use for which therapy? So how do we make it easy on the hospital facing front? Um, how do we make it as user friendly? How is the implementation going to be on their end? Um, and if that sits on a business process that's manual, it may work on our side, that may work for us because again, we're in a, a small space at the moment. How about the others who may be more advanced, whether it be Bear or it be even uh, Archmo Consulting that has seen some more mature companies? Any thoughts? Yeah, I could chime in here, Devendra. I mean, I don't know if we're more ma mature. Um, we don't. We don't have a uh, a process in place. We're still in um, evaluation mode. But I think it's it's you know similar user requirements to what Eileen mentioned around having the um, actually automation is one of the requirements general category. Uh, we don't want a manual process. Um, of course, we have to have all the traceability requirements, etc. But also we want integration. So we want to talk to our our um, our ERP um, uh, um, pro uh, program and so on. So yeah, that's I mean that's high level what um, what we're seeking. Um, at, at, at Bayer and it's still, I think the next step uh, is we've targeted a, a vendor. We're gonna go you know, to one of the vendors that's um, developing in this space to do some proto prototyping with our ongoing clinical trials and, and you know, then hopefully be ready <laughs> uh, by the time we get to commercial with, with, you know, with a, a system and, and process uh, in place. But it's still, uh, yeah, kind of a construction area, I would say. And I, I would love to chime in. Um, I, I think, you know, our own experience uh, from an allogeneic standpoint uh, is to, you know, where appropriate design a system. So I think for our, our business, we, we, we plan on having a, a validated system from inventory to patient. But when it comes to the upstream supply chain uh, of an allogeneic process, we thought it was not appropriate to extend the system uh, as a manual process can work effectively with documentation and validation. Um, and I think it, it, every company you need, it needs to go through what Chris is describing, which is the, the appropriate valuation of where the system makes sense. Um, the one thing I will say is what I think is still necessary is, is some further technological advancement. Um, you know, the things I, I remember looking at technologies that really enable better uh, barcode-like uh, tracking in cryogenic uh, storage, uh, which oftentimes gets interfered. You know, if ice covering a barcode uh, can become a challenge. Uh, and so advances in technology in that space that can enable you know, better systems to, to enable that automation are really gonna drive us to have a more robust process uh, in a few years than where we are today. I really like your focus on the ice-covered barcodes. It, it gives us a lot, lot to think about. So thank you. Thank you very much. I wanted to follow up and request you if you could shed more light and uh, kind of build upon what Timothy Moore said about the need for predictive tools in that end-to-end -end patient data. Could you identify a couple of areas that you prioritize for predictive analytics? Anything that comes to your mind right off the bat? Anyone? I'll start, Devendra. I, I absolutely, from a standpoint of distribution planning, planning, um, inventory storage, uh, optimization problems that have been well, you know, solved in, in supply chain theory are, are absolutely great for that kind of uh, analytics. Uh, and I think it just, it, it depends on the kind of products and the kind of supply chain that you have uh, to manage it, uh, you know, appropriately to, to set up those analytics. Thank you. Anyone else? 
If not, I would like to move to something that was alluded to a little briefly. Considering the enormous cost of a treatment for cell gene therapy, and all the efforts are being made, as we heard over and over again this morning, about optimizing the process and the entire, entire business. Kevin, what is your understanding of the landscape of the payer, the payee, and other stakeholders in our, in our industry? What are the challenges and opportunities where a difference needs to be made? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's, there's almost a, a, do I dare say, a conflict going on out there today. And I don't mean that in a bad way to be candid with you. I think it's just factual. And, you know, the facts are in, let's just pick on the states today. That's what we're all <clears throat> focused right now. Uh, you know, will be for sure in the future, if not everyone is. Um, you know, here, here in the states, the entities that control for a prescription are dispensed are the PBMs. And I worked for Express Scripts for 14 years, so clearly know that market pretty well. <clears throat> and they want to be able to control the prescription for their plan sponsors, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, for example. And the best way for them to do so is to force prescriptions to go through their specialty pharmacy and their specialty distributor. So that's how the U.S. system is set up today for normal, typical orphan drugs. The problem is here comes cell gene therapy that are curative. They're not chronic clearly um and they today especially car t's need to be administered in a hospital so now the hospitals of course want to make sure that they are involved and rightfully they should be involved the hospitals want to make sure that they are you know getting reimbursed and compensated for uh, said products and etc um but then you have the payers not wanting to maybe enact that mechanism so what we have seen develop over the last even last couple of months with different payment mechanisms and schemes are companies like Optum and Optum Frontier Therapies with the parent company United getting into different types of mechanisms to pay for these ultra orphan super expensive products. And it might be a PMPM model per number per month model or it might be an initiation fee. So plan sponsors and members are covered uh, for emergency use type of products, uh, you know, in cell gene therapy. They all seem to have a different twist but they all end up being Devondra, like a pay overtime mechanism. And of course, the biggest problem, and then I'll open it up for my, my colleagues to comment if they have the comments, but the, the biggest problem is insurance companies, plan sponsors, aren't thinking long term for Kevin Cast of the world because they might have me one, two, three, four years. Well, how do you amortize a two plus million dollar drug over a couple of years for a 58 year old man? That's hard to do, right? So the system is still needs to advance and evolve uh, and really just ad adapt itself to follow the patient, perhaps not just the payer, if that makes sense. And it just isn't set up to do so today. Thank you for that insight, Kevin. Uh, anyone else that has had any experience dealing with these other stakeholders? If not, I want to play back a very strong observation made by David Caracas at Bloomberg, a very wise recommendation. He says, hey, supply chain folks, you must drive the ERP selection process and not be driven by IT folks. I would, I would frame that in gold in, in my office because in our case of cell and gene therapy, where the demands, the challenges are upon us, we have to do the right things. And you understand what the requirements are. You have a problem that has to be solved and not a technology that has to find a home. So David, Thank you for that very wise counsel you've given us all. Uh, Matt, you got a question from Brad Heller. 
Is there any standardization in the industry in the process of freezing down starting material for cell therapy, both in terms of the media used with the cells and let me read the rest of it. Mm. And uh, the technical aspects of how it is frozen. Um, I, I'm not a process development expert, um, but I will at least give you the supply chain view of it. Um, I, my understanding, you know, commercial expectations, especially for cryopreservation, um, would include, you know, using a validated controlled rate freezer um, that you've run that study and, and demonstrated uh, the, the freezing process is uniform and appropriate. Um, and, and, and also studies for any uh, cryopreservance that you use in your formulation uh, and their effects on your, on your product. So, you know, as an, for us, I think it's an example of uh, DMSO is a fairly common uh, T cell uh, additive for cryopreservation. And we would certainly run a, a study to show how that affects our products um, from a performance standpoint, as well as uh, the, the ability for the products to recover from cryopreservation. Thank you. Any other thoughts? If not, I'd like to dwell on the issue that was brought out earlier a couple of times, single source for these critical materials. Forget the temporary setback caused by the COVID pandemic. Any one of you with some experience on how you have dealt with this chronic problem that we have in cell and gene therapy of being single sourced? Any success stories? Anyone? I, I'll chime in here, uh, Devendra. I think, um, you know, it, it, it's absolutely a, a serious problem for, I think, our industry. There's, there's lots of single source um, materials, uh, and oftentimes some of those suppliers don't have the maturity that you'd hope for uh, as, you're, as you're getting your product uh, to commercialization. Um, what I think has worked well for, for us and our experience is identifying the most critical supplies and leveraging the relationships um, on that front and then planning accordingly. And, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give another shout out, I think to Greg was mentioned earlier uh, from Be The Match Biotherapies. Our most critical supply is, is, is obviously that apheresis uh, starting material. And uh, we have a very close relationship working with years uh, with uh, Be The Match uh, and helping us identify the right donors and, and secure them and deliver them to our facility. Uh, with the appropriate control and quality, and uh, and and we we also mitigated ourselves with inventory uh, as 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 is necessary across your supply chain, right? In the case of the pandemic, when it did hit, and we were all a bit uncertain about the impact on um, our therapies, you know, we we made a decision proactively uh, with with be the match to 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 halt our um, collections until we could implement additional safety uh, test for COVID for the donors. And we were able to do that because of, you know, the ability to store inventory uh, to mitigate that kind of an interruption. So uh, it's, just a, it's just a case study among many challenges that affect, I think, all of our companies, um, you know, working, finding the right partner and, and really working with them uh, is, is, the, is the best approach. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, Devinder, this I would um, maybe just Add to Matt's comment there around, um, you know, this area is uh, developing. I had a colleague who's, you know, grew, grew up, so to speak, in the MAB space and said, yeah, it reminds me of, you know, 30 years ago um, in that area, uh, kind of the Wild West. And uh, like what Matt mentioned, a lot of the vendors, there's a lot of risk, right? A lot of the vendors uh, that we're using or, you know, development is using 
don't know if they can really be commercialized and so on. Um, so it's definitely it's definitely an area where the, the supplier landscape has to grow with with the industry. Um, so don't don't really have a good success story, but just to repeat that, yeah, it's a big risk. Where we have had some successes is, I think, as mentioned, is in partnering, like in the disposable space, in our you know factor eight uh, manufacturing, which we've been doing for almost thirty years actually. Uh, our procurement team spent a lot of years working with some of these smaller suppliers and actually helping them develop their business uh, to be more robust um, and build up. So you know that partnership is probably probably the, the, the way to go. Um, and, and as mentioned, and, you know, it's hard to talk about this without mentioning COVID, but we see that impact, you know, all over the place, especially with uh, single use materials and, and like, uh, you know, not just inventory, but at this point we're ordering way ahead of time, you know, through 2022. And I've got, we've got a development project where they want to order stuff for development runs 15 months ahead of time, which is kind of unheard of in the past. But now we're like, yeah, that makes total sense. Let's let's do it. Um, so a lot of, I guess, short term risk mitigation. So lead time, lead time has gotten longer and longer. Someone yeah. else have talked. Yeah, I know that 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 is exactly it. What Chris had said for us, we know we are now planning lead times that are longer than what they were originally quoted to us and in, in our SNOP process have taken to approving such long lead time bias, right? And and that's what that that's what has worked for us. Got it. Now you you all have to forgive me for catching you off guard with my probably the final question. We have this unique opportunity where you are a voice for all the suppliers and technology enablers, product providers out there in our industry. They're listening to you. And we will obviously disseminate this knowledge experience you've shared with us in the days and weeks to come. What is one single message you'd like to give that supplier community that could help advance and accelerate the evolution of this very revolutionary therapy called cell and gene therapy. What would you recommend to them that they do, they focus on? What is the area you would like them to bring solutions to you? So who wants to go first? I can go first. So, and I think Tim touched on this too in his keynote, right? Successful operations in our environment really involve seamlessness or seamless transition in this ecosystem. So with our suppliers, manufacturing quality, logistics provider, and then ultimately patient and physician. So I think we will see a lot more of this sharing and sharing across this ecosystem. And that hasn't quite really happened that transparency hasn't happened in the past right I, I there had been movement on trying to see how much inventory everybody has i know that then you get caught up in legal terms and such and, and you don't know uh but i, I think um for all of us in our in in this ecosystem there will be more transparency and sharing and and, and maybe I'll, I'll just leave it at that high level that i think hopefully our organizations are more open into uh, sharing information and cross-sharing data across uh, across our ecosystem. So, Eileen, uh, uh, if I may just uh, dwell upon that for a moment, is it in the area of technology, meaning information technology of track and trace, where you would prioritize, or would it be in storage and logistics, or would it be in CRO and CMO? How would you prioritize, if it is possible to prioritize? Or maybe it's all of them. It's, I think it's going to have to be all of them. Um, and if I look at it from a, but if I do look at it from a customer lens, yeah, the easiest one would be material to the customer, right? Material to the patient. So we would prioritize the distribution and logistics point first. But from a manufacturing standpoint, of course, I'd like to see what's downstream as well. And then I would pray, then the, that would be the next step would be our supply base and the, the transparency and visibility 
boy bed. That gives me a lot of clarity of direction. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Devinder, I guess maybe I would add to that. Um, you know, for these companies, to, these suppliers in this growing ecosystem to really plan for the future, plan for success. You know, uh, if this if this thing is really growing exponentially, that's got to be, uh, you know, that should be planned for. If you know, GM, like I mentioned, GMP capability. Uh, if they if they're going to supply clinical and commercial, have a plan. You know, to do that, start on that. You know, now and capacity. Right. So, you know, um, that they can grow, they can grow with, with the, the industry, with the market um, and not be playing, playing catch up. Well, put, yeah. sir. I'm going to yes. maybe build on what Chris said, because I, I, I definitely, it's hard to prioritize, but certainly the supplier raw material space comes to mind for me. Um, you know, there's, there's a tremendous amount of therapies in, in cell and gene that are coming quickly from development from an academic type setting to uh, clinical trials with commercial dreams. And um, I know a lot of suppliers are hesitant to make the kind of investments or testing and manufacturing to, uh, you know, achieve uh, a commercial ready product and, and you know, want to protect themselves, classify things as research use only uh, and, and put the liability back onto the, the, uh, the innovative company. Um, my advice is, again, I think that's where relationships and even, you know, partnerships can pay off. If, if, if you find that, uh, you know, a, a few small startups are using your materials uh, and have intentions uh, long term, that's where working together to, you know, stomach uh, and, and share some of that cost to get to commercialization can make a lot of sense and can really transform their business. So, Communication and, and, and partnership from the suppliers is, is, is very much welcome as we continue to grow the, the, the processing technology in the space. Coming from a very large organization like yours, Chris, that I hear it loud and clear. Thank you. Yeah, and just to add just real quick, sorry to Matt, that I was also relate an example with one of our new uh, products, you know, in the pipeline where one of the exotic suppliers is looking for a 10 year um, uh, volume commitment. <laughs> so uh, they, they want to partner might be a little, a little long, but uh, it goes in the same direction of what, what you're saying. They, they need to know they're going to have some revenue, I guess, to, um, to be able to invest in themselves. I just want to remind everyone and end on that note that in the last four years, we have, uh, guess what, had seven products for cell and gene therapies. FDA projects the number is going to be more like 20 by the year 2025, which says to me, our future is very, very bright and we should be expon expecting exponential growth. So on that note, I want to thank our eminent panelists for helping us understand the supply chain challenges and also provide some direction and some uh, knowledge and experience on how we as an industry can go forward. So thank you all. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.